Hey everybody, this is Brian with the Instructional Technologies Coordinator Team, and we are going over a digital workflow for collecting student work. And what that means is it's the new way that we begin to collect student work um, in the digital age, as we have devices in hands of students and teachers, and instead of pushing papers back and forth, we've got a new way of collecting work from students, assessing work from students. And so this presentation is going to go over that. Just to answer questions right on the forefront, we are using an app that's part of our core apps uh, in the school district of Waukesha called Explain Everything on the iPad. It's available to students and to teachers. So if you have questions about how this particular presentation was made, it was made through the use of Explain Everything. So um, this is a digital workflow, and there's two pieces that we want to talk about. We want to talk about the use of the iPads and the use of Google Drive. These become the primary resources here as we talk about this key part, collecting student work. This is not so much about distributing content out to students. We'll have a follow-up video for that. This is how we get work back from students, assess that work, and then get it, get it out to students right away. So um, we're going to jump into the next slide. So the first question a lot of people have is, what is a workflow? And a workflow is something we're actually very comfortable with because we do it every day. In paper uh, form, really what a workflow is, is it's having a teacher need to get resources to a student, having that student write on and complete those that work sometimes, getting it back to the teacher, who then assesses that work and gets it back to the student. This is just a, a regular everyday occurrence that we have in our classrooms in which uh, we don't think much about it. We don't probably have an, a terminology for it, but this is really just a workflow. The key piece to all of this, though, is that as we introduce technology into the mix, this workflow begins to get disrupted and has to change in order to, to gain more efficiency and really to work more meaningfully for students and for teachers. So as we look at the key players in a workflow, which are the student and the teacher, we have to set up some sort of a structure. And although we're in this transition phase right now between paper to digital, um, workflows still need to exist in order for us to get our jobs done and for students to demonstrate what they know. Now, we can avoid setting up a workflow um, and teachers can kind of continue on without following some sort of a strategy for doing this. We don't recommend it because it begins to look a little bit more like this. If we were just to have students email us work, um, our inboxes would begin to fill up with these kinds of emails as students mailed work to us. And the problem with this is while we can always search email, we can always save email, um, it gets a little bit confusing and hard to track. So we really want to stay away from a workflow where it's just an email-based workflow back and forth. So that's why we've got a strategy for workflow. So there's a couple of steps, and I just want to lay out in this uh, presentation. Whenever you see this icon, it's something the teacher is really going to be responsible for. And the first thing that a teacher needs to think about before the students ever arrive is the idea that they've got to create some sort of file naming strategy. Now, this is actually not completely foreign to teachers. Um, whenever we hear teachers say things like, make sure you put your name on the paper, make sure you date the paper, make sure you put the title of the assignment on the paper in a paper environment, we feel pretty comfortable with that. Well, in a digital environment, we have to have some equivalent. Otherwise, we're going to have a lot of lost files and resources kind of all over the place. So we've got to create a file naming strategy. <laughs> it makes finding and uh, assessing work easier. Ultimately, one thing that you've got to remember is that electronic files are generally named alphabetically. So one of the things that you're going to think about as you create a file naming strategy for your classroom is to always consider putting the last name first. The value in this is it will, your, uh, as you assess work, it will begin to reflect what is happening in your student information system and gradebook. And so you can begin to line up what's ha you know, your work that you're assessing and also the gradebook as you do entry of data. And finally, as you come up with a file naming strategy, which I'll, sh I'll show you an example of in the next slide, be really conscious about creating posters or some sort of signage and placing that around the room to remind students of the naming strategy. Now, in our best, most effective uh, environments, 
Schools will come up with a consistent naming strategy and all kids will fall into a common naming strategy that they'll use no matter where they are. So uh, we encourage you to really think about this on a more global perspective from your school. But even if you have just a unique naming strategy in your classroom, it's likely to be different than others. And so we really encourage you to create posters and place this naming strategy around for kids to use. And then really focus on using it, right? So making sure that students are naming files the correct way is going to be a key piece to kind of keeping your sanity as digital work comes in. So here's an example of a sample file naming strategy. I've taken this right from our Google Docs area here. So um, when a student turns on an assignment in my classroom, they're going to go last name first. So we see that last name right here. Okay, comma, first name. This helps in case I've got kids with similar last names. Then dash some sort of an assignment code. Now you probably can get more creative than assignment three, but you don't want your file names to be too long either, and you don't want them to be difficult for students to spell. So giving it some sort of a, an assignment name might be a really key piece, but try to keep it simple. And then it might be important for you to organize by a class that you teach. So if you're a secondary middle school teacher and you uh, have a lot of different preps that you teach, having this in place might be key. And also the hour number if you've got multiple sections of the same course. So this is just a sample file naming strategy, but the key pieces that you want to consider are last name first, okay, and then also some sort of a code or some sort of a, a consistent way that you will alphabetize and name all of your assignments. This will help a lot later when you're trying to sort assignments. So that's a sample file naming strategy. You don't have to use that one, but it is certainly one um, that would work for you if you were interested. Okay, so again, now we're still in the place where we are before students have arrived to class, and this is some work that a teacher can do. Teachers are really going to want to locate, have one location where all of their student work is. And, and in a little while, I'm going to show you how each student is setting up their own unique folder. But you're going to want to have one place where you put all of your student work by class hour or by subject, if that makes sense for you. Of course, the worlds of elementary and secondary are a little bit different here. So you're going to have to make some decisions about what makes sense for you. But using Google Drive... You're going to set up course folders that will allow teachers uh, to organize their student work. The only thing that I warn you about here is you have to think about the long-term game here. So hopefully we'll be using this resource for quite some time. You want to be sure that you ultimately are dating and naming your files properly so that later on, perhaps second semester or when you get a new batch of kids or even next year, you don't have confusion about where student work is being placed. So be sure that you really focus on giving your uh, Google Drive folders a name. And so here's an example that might look like. Right, now this one, this picture was taken from the iPad Google Drive app. You can do this uh, and recommend you do this right on your uh, computer, MacBook, whatever it might be. But here is a sample teacher folder structure. So you can see... Once I know what hours I'm teaching, I come up with a consistent naming convention and I name my classwork folders here. So beauty is it's alphabetical, so I would generally recommend you start with the name first. If you have multiple sections and it makes sense to do so, you may want to separate that out. Okay, so here you see English 9, Hour 1, Hour 5. The reason they're appearing this order is because it is arranged alphabetically. One comes before five. And so that's why it comes in that order. And then as I said at the end there, this last piece is being able to identify which school year it is from. So if that's an important piece for you, this one should be named a little differently, but you get the general idea of it, okay? So before students arrive, but once you know what courses you'll be teaching for the semester, trimester, for the year, whatever it may be, this might be a good idea for you to think about and to, to pre-set up. I'm gonna zoom that down, okay? So this is what a sample teacher folder structure would look like. Again, before the students arrive, this could be set up, and this is work done by the teacher in the teacher's Google Drive. Okay, so where do we go from there? 
So now we're in the first days of school here. I want to highlight that. So now you've got students in front of you. You've, you've gotten your introductions out of the way. You're kind of up and running, but you definitely want to set up a way that you're getting work back from that. You want to do this early, and we recommend you do it consistently. You don't want to let this be done over the course of a few weeks because that's going to be a little bit more difficult for you to manage. Honestly, this is best done and easiest done if you would do this during a class period with students. It should really only take maybe 15, 20, 30, you know, 25 minutes, depending on the age level of the students. But once you've got it, it all becomes a lot easier to do, and it's easier if it's done in bunches. So what are we going to instruct students to do? Well, remember, we are going to be using, students have iPads in hand, but that's okay. That works just fine for what we're doing here. On the iPad, students are going to create a folder in Google Drive where all of the work for their course must be played, placed. Now this is going to be a unique folder for this particular course or for your particular classroom. So you definitely want to instruct them if they've got work for other courses, it does not go into this particular uh, folder. This is just for your class. And it's important that you really hold the line on that because if, if their uh, digital sloppiness begins to kind of permeate into your classroom, you're going to be a little bit more disorganized and it's going to be harder to find things. So you definitely want to hold the line on this and really encourage, encourage them to have one folder for your particular class. So the other piece of this is you're going to provide a folder naming strategy. A few slides back we talked about how the uh, you're going to come up with a, a file naming strategy for your entire class. You're going to put that on, po on posters. For this particular work, you're also going to come up with a consistent strategy. I'll show you an example in just a moment. And then the last piece is you're going to, once you, they've named and created that folder, they're going to share that folder with you, and they're going to give you edit privileges. And edit privileges basically will allow you for the rest of the year to be able to get in and take a look at that work and get down to a very meaningful level, looking at things like revision history and comments and things like that. So you definitely want to have them share that folder with you and uh, do it with edit privileges. So what does that look like? So let's take a look at a sample setting of a student work folder. So again, this is again the first day of schools, and this is the work of the student. So we'll enlarge that just a little bit. This is done in Google Drive. It can be done from an iPad in the uh, Google Drive app, or it can be done in, uh, from a browser on an iPad as well. The student goes into Google Drive. We'll hide some of these out here for just a second. Student goes into Google Drive. They create a new folder, and they name it with a convention that you've already given them. Now, it's best if this convention follows suit with all of the other assignment conventions that you'll have throughout the year. But just to take a quick look at it, last name first is a really good idea because it will organize alphabetically. If it pertains to you, this is the class that they're teaching. Okay, this could be your name. This could be the course that they're taking with you. Again, if it pertains to you, you may want to include the hour just for organization's sake. And we always recommend that you do this for both your sake and for the student's sake of putting a date in there of the school year so that kids know uh, when the work is from and don't get confused later on. So that's what the folder would look like in the naming structure. You do want this to be consistent because it could get really ugly electronically if the next person were to name theirs something like this. Now try to sort them out and you're going to have inconsistencies in this. So you really want to encourage students to do this a very specific way as they are working. All right, so we're going to try to get this out of the way. And let's see if we can get this guy out of the way here. So that's the first part is creating the folder. The second step, again, which can be done from the iPad Google Drive app or from the desktop app. You're seeing the Google Drive, uh, I'm sorry, you're seeing the desktop version of this, but that's also accessible on the iPads. It's just the sharing settings. So first thing to note is the folder will and can remain private. We encourage that. There's nothing wrong with it being private because the student is the owner of it and they're going to give you specific edit access, but they don't have to give it to the rest of the world. Here, they're going to put in your email address, something ending at waukesha.k12.wi.us, and they are going to give you can edit access. And this is going to give you all of the access that you'll need for the year. So this is really the key piece of the whole thing. When sharing is set up properly, 
on a folder. So remember, we're working with a folder. When sharing set up properly on a folder, all of the assignments in that folder for the year take on the same sharing settings unless they are specifically changed not to do that. So um, in this case, once we've got the folder set up properly, any documents a student creates or places inside of that folder will automatically be shared with you with edit access for the remainder of the year. So you can see how this really gains efficiency and we don't have issues with kids forgetting to, to set the sharing settings on every single assignment properly. <laughs> so that's how we set up uh, our sharing settings on the folders for the all right, to the next. So here we are, we're in the first days of school, and this is now, you've, you've talked to your class, you've had them set up their folders for your class, and you've had, them, um, you've had them share it with you properly. So you sit down in the few minutes between class or after they have done this activity, and how are you going to get what you are looking for into the same place. So I'm going to jump you in. This is work done by the teacher in Google Drive. I do recommend that this is done from a desktop. It will make your life a little bit easier. So use your MacBook for this particular case. And let me get these guys out of the way while I bring this up. So you have now... Let me bring this to the front. So you have now had all of your students share their folders and create them with you. You're going to go into Google Drive, again, recommended from the desktop in this case, logged in as the teacher. You are going to, to click on this little arrow right here. It's a little drop-down arrow to the left of my drive, and that is going to show all of those course folders that we set up just a few steps ago before the kids arrived. We set up the course folders. What we need to do or what we're trying to achieve is to move these shared um, these shared resource folders here, this, the, where the work is going to be put. We're going to try to move them into the appropriate work folder, which in this case is English 9, Hour 1. So we've got to get them in there. Okay. Well, how do we do that? We first click Shared With Me. Once we've, moved, once we've opened all of this up, and these folders will appear. This is why we recommend you do this almost immediately after the students have shared with you their resources. And it's also the reason that we recommend that you have all the students do it at the same time. This is going to make it a lot easier. So what you do is you check the boxes for the students who are in English 9, Hour 1. We then come on over here and we click More. So once they're checked, we click More. We click Move To. Now I'm going to shrink this out for you. So th those are the first pieces we do. And this window is going to appear. Now all we have to do is check the, the uh, folder we want to move it to. So I'm going to go ahead and check this. And a little check mark is going to appear right next to it, so you know that it's selected. And right down here, once we've done that, the Move button will turn blue, and we can click it. Well, what's that going to do for us? Let me slide this guy up to the front. So what that will do for us is once we've clicked the Move button, it is going to see, here you can see this is red, this is English 9, Hour 1, English 9, Hour 1, and the students' folders where all of their work for the class will be placed are all located one click away. So this is our way of sorting all of the student work by a folder. So we feel that this is going to help you because you'll have one location to go find all of your resources. So, that's pretty much the main part of the, of the process. And once you've got that set up for your students who are coming in for a semester, for a trimester, for a year, once you've gone through that process with them, your sharing settings are set appropriately. Now, one of the things we're hearing from teachers who are actually doing this today is that this can be a little bit cumbersome. Even though we've got it all organized and in one place, 
Um, they're saying if we've got 150, 180 students that you're working with, to go into 180 different folders and check out all the work for that's being submitted there can be a little bit cumbersome. The other piece of that, so that's this whole piece about too many files and too many student folders can be really overwhelming. And we certainly understand that, and some of your colleagues have started to think about that. That also leads to one other piece. So in the world of digital work collection, there no longer is a Dropbox or a collection date, which means that some of your students might get their work done two weeks early, two days early. Some of their students won't be done for two weeks after the work was intended to be due. And as a result of that, you are left kind of in a mixed bag of understanding when the work is actually going to be turned into you, when it has actually been completed. In the old days of paper collection, this was done by the kid handing you their final version of that work, or at least what they were representing as their final version of that work. And you knew at that point that the clock was really ticking for you to get them feedback. In the digital world, where work is turned in digitally, this becomes a little bit more problematic. If a student is done two weeks early, how are you to know that you're supposed to get them feedback? But yet for them, the clock starts ticking as soon as the work is done. Now, obviously, good old-fashioned communication where, they, where the student speaks with you about when their work is done is probably the most effective way to do this. But that's not something that's always uh, a piece that we can count on. So we have another option that might work that was designed by some of your colleagues who ran into issues with this. The idea is to create a digital Dropbox for your homework. Again, all of the steps leading up to this, we strongly encourage you still follow them because uh, the digital Dropbox without doing all of those other pieces is wrought with possible errors. For instance, students now have to set permissions on every single piece of work and they have to set them properly for you to access them, even in this digital Dropbox uh, configuration. So all of the pieces in this presentation to this point are really critical to make digital Dropbox as effective as it can be. So this presentation isn't going to teach you the tool, but it is going to point you to the right tool. We are working in Google Drive, and inside of Google Drive, there's a tool called Google Forms. Google Forms is a data collection tool that takes whatever data you can collect, it's a way of collecting survey data, and putting it into a back-end spreadsheet. Now, if you're not familiar with Google Forms, we, there's a lot of resources out there that, that will help you. Uh, our Instructional Technologies page will help you. We've got Blackboard courses that can help you with Google Apps and Google Forms. So this, again, pre this presentation isn't going to teach you how to use Google Forms, but knowing the tool will get you in the right direction to start learning it if it's brand new to you. So this is Google Forms. We're going to slide that off to the side here. Okay. Now, in Google, Form, uh, in Google Drive... So we're working with Google Drive right now. When I go into Google Drive on my desktop, I see an option here called Google Forms. So I click Create, Create, and Forms pops up, and I click Google Forms. Google Forms will take me to a Forms Editor. Slide that out of the way. And in that Form Editor, I can begin to create something that looks like this. Let me bring this guy to the front. I create something that looks like this. Now, what are the key pieces here? Well, it's pretty consistent with what we've talked about before. We want the student's last name separate from their first name. Okay, This allows us to sort later on by last name, which is valuable. It may be valuable for you to know what period the student is coming from. It may also be valuable, depending on what you teach, to, to determine what class the student's from. So if you want to have a one Dropbox for all of your classes, you can certainly do that. You just have to add one more question, one more question that says, what class are you in? And that'll be a drop-down list as well. The next piece we recommend is having a multiple choice or a drop-down list called assignment title. Now you don't have to know the assignments for all for your entire class right away in order to use this tool because this can be updated as you go. So right now I've got assignments 1, 2, and 3 here, but when I make the change to assignment 4, I come into Google Forms, I edit this question, and I add the new assignments. 
The value here, and I'll show you this in just a moment, but the value here is all of the assignments the students select are named the same thing. This comes back to that whole idea of the class code, um, which in the electronic world makes a big deal. And then the last piece of this, even though you know where to find the student's work because you've set up you've set up this uh, workflow in which you're sharing the students sharing documents in a class folder for you, you ask them for the URL for their particular work. This is the web address. Remember, everything that drops into Google Docs has a web address tied to it, whether it's a picture, a smart notebook file, a Google document, uh, doesn't matter, they all have some sort of a web address. When the student clicks on the share button, they get the web address and they can simply paste it in here. Then the student clicks submit. So we're going to shrink this guy down here just one more time here. So that's all work that's done by the student. And now you, as the teacher, let me bring this forward quickly. So now you, as the teacher, can drop into uh, your Google Drive. So again, this, this piece will be found in Google Drive in a spreadsheet. And this is what it looks like on the back end of it. So some key pieces that you'll want to pay attention to here. Now that we've got this split out by last name, I can actually sort by last name by clicking this little arrow here, sorting A to Z, and now all of Harrison's work is going to be in, in, in row. So if you're having a you know meeting with parents or um, want to communicate with the students specifically, you can sort specifically by their last name and see what work has been turned in. We can also sort by period here by clicking the drop-down button and sorting by period. And so if you've got lots of different classes submitting to the same Dropbox, you can sort by period and grade period one, period two, period three's work. We can also sort by the assignment title. And because it's a drop-down list as opposed to the students just typing it in, this sorts very nicely without any errors. And now I can, I can sort by assignment one. It automatically is going to alphabetize assignment one. And right here is the key to the whole thing. I can click on this particular uh, URL. It will open up in a new window for me. I can add my comments inside of it as a Google document. I can open it in Notability on, a, on a, my iPad if I choose to do that and write comments over the top of it that way. Um, lots of things that I can do with it here. But the key is now I've got a live link to it all in one spreadsheet for all of my assignments for all of my students. So now I don't need to necessarily drop into all of these different folders unless I want to, for instance, to get in and say, okay, this particular piece here, looking at your revision history, it's not working for me, or this is really great work on your part. But here I've got one place where once the student has finished the work to the best of his or her ability, I know where to find final work. And this is where I do all of my grading from. And I do all my checking in in the folder, uh, folder area. So basically, that's the rundown on creating a digital Dropbox for homework. And if, the, if this last part is a little bit overwhelming to you, this all can be done without the digital Dropbox. But for some users, this makes a ton of sense. And they're going to see right away the value in doing this. So. Hopefully this whole process is beginning to make sense for you and that they explain everything with the specific steps. We'll walk you through how to set up a digital workflow. As always, if you have questions, if you have ideas, if you have better ways of doing any of this, we love to hear them. Uh, feel free to email any of us and we will be uh, happy to take a swing at answering questions. So thank you so much for your time. And as always, feel free to contact us if you need additional assistance.